So thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we we are starting a new series of virtual uh, retailer trainings, and we're going to be doing two a month going forward. Um, and this one is all about how to reopen your draft system properly. So one of the first things I wanted to cover um, before we get started, I, I'm just going to speak in the beginning and then hand it off to our, our drafts team. Um, I do compliance here at Lakeshore Beverage and training, and I uh, just wanted to cover a little bit of what we can and can't do so you have an idea of what we can provide uh, service-wise. You know, we are here to help, uh, but we are uh, limited by uh, the Liquor Commission on what we can do. So we, we are allowed to service rods, taps, faucets, fittings and lines. Uh, however, any parts that we do, whether it's a coupler, a faucet, a washer, um, those have to be invoiced and paid for by the retailer. And we are strictly forbidden from doing any kind of draft line cleaning. So if we, we do service, uh, let's say on your faucet and your line, we wouldn't be able to clean that line or faucet. You would have to do that through your third party line cleaning service. Uh, we are also not allowed to do any kind of installation beyond what we just talked about. So we can install your coupler on, we can help you with your faucet. We cannot do any kind of installation of your, your overall draft system or installing a new regulator or glycol system or anything like that. So we just wanted to be, be upfront and clear uh, on that. But within our, you know, the legalities that we can do, we want to help everyone as much as possible. Uh, if you need any of that, that equipment, we, we do really recommend reaching out to Patrick at Micromatic. That's where we get all of our uh, draft, draft dispensing equipment from. Um, they are the industry leaders in draft dispensing equipment. And you can see Patrick's contact here. We'll also be putting this slideshow up on our, uh, on our website so you'll be able to access this information again later. That was me, Chris Kaloje, Training and Compliance, and then I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Mike Rosmus, who is our channel manager for special events. Mike, are you out there? Got it. Thanks, Chris. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Good. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are excited for... Uh, all the openings happening, obviously, with under the, uh, the craziness that's happened over here in the last, especially the last week. But I uh, hope everyone is getting uh, ready to open or has been open um, so everyone can enjoy a cold beverage or maybe even six. Uh, so lots of uh, favorite food and overall enjoyment from your establishment. So, again, thanks for joining. And uh, uh, we want to educate as much as we can here. So. Uh, I would like to quickly go uh, give an overview of our, our hardworking department. Um, this channel of our business oversees major venue accounts, uh, all special events, and of course, draft beer. Uh, from the north, uh, Eric Baum is our special event and draft manager uh, for the Lake, Lakeshore Beverage Territory, uh, north side of Chicago, up to the Wisconsin border, west to uh, Woodstock, so a pretty large territory that they cover. Um, also, Patrick McCarthy also joins Eric to the north as our special event rep. Uh, as we move south, uh, Ricardo Garcia and his, and his team mainly cover the city of Chicago territory and a bulk of our high volume, high profile events, um, you know, street festivals to Lollapalooza to Windy City Small Cup, just a ton of uh, great events that uh, obviously we're missing right now, but uh, we'll, we'll get back to you soon. Um, so Jordan Flores, Andy Cabrales, Moshe Tijin are our special, uh, Chicago, excuse me, uh, Chicago special event reps uh, that oversee the Chicago areas. Uh, as we move south, uh, Mark Eckert handles a very large territory um, to our south. So from 95th Street, south past, way past Kankakee, um, to as far south as uh, one of our small towns, uh, south Watsika. Um, but th these guys are down there and into the west, and uh, again, all the way up to the Wisconsin border. So uh, Joe Setti, Aaron Mead are our special event reps to the south. 
um, as we go into our, our venue business, Sal Carmona. Uh, I think he's been with us for 75 years, um, uh, but is only 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 35, so I don't, I don't understand that one. But anyways, uh, he uh, heads up our venue business along with Jake and Jordan uh, Johns, which includes uh, several sports, music, travel, and convention accounts across Lakeshore uh, beverage footprints. Um, so, so some exciting stuff there. Um, and again, over this team covers over 300 special events annually from street festivals to golf tournaments to concerts to craft beer festivals and on and on. Uh, so very exciting things um, that they, they manage and, and execute very well. Uh, over 1,600 venue uh, events annually, uh, Major League Baseball, Minor League, NHL, NBA stadiums, indoor, outdoor music venues to our, our large airports, O'Hare and Midway, uh, convention, convention centers, um, anything that's considered an event, all these guys above are, are just a key element to it and, and kick ass. So um, hats off to them. And um, of course, these, these people are available to support any one of your draft accounts out there within the ILCC guidelines that Chris mentioned uh, recently. Um, this team is around draft beer seven days a week. So uh, we wanted to put this together to help all of you understand draft beer a little bit more. Uh, to be ready to serve cold quality draft beer once again uh, to your valid customers. So um, we'll go over the agenda and I'll let, have Eric uh, Baum um, take it over from there. Um, so we did the uh, welcome introductions, ILC, uh, excuse me, ILCC guidelines from, from Chris, uh, product review and freshness uh, we'll, we'll go over, um, you know, especially dealing with your, your everyday sales rep and area sales managers. Uh, beer line cleaning is very important, especially getting up and moving here. Um, you know, if it's been idle for a very long time, um, it's going to be very important. So Eric will cover that. Uh, glycol power packs, if we have a long draw system, um, there's some, some things that we want to point out that may not get the attention that it normally gets. Um, and, and definitely getting it started up and, and knowing what temperatures that should be set at. And of course, any of these things um, can be referenced back to your line installer or, or give us a call and we'll, we'll help you walk through that. Um, gas system between CO2 on a, on a direct draw system to nitrogen and CO2 on a bulk, I'm sorry, on a long draw system. So going through that and you know how to turn it on and, and, and what um, blender boxes do, uh, keg types, we've seen them all, um, you know, half barrels, quarter barrels, six barrels, uh, keg couplers, you know, there's different different couplers, there's European, there's uh, domestic. So we'll, we'll show you those and, and and make sure you know which ones go to what. We won't cover every brand here, but uh, again, we'll, we'll be available to answer any questions in the future. Uh, tapping the keg, uh, fobs. So uh, not everyone has these. Uh, we really, you know, heavy, heavily recommend having these. Um, it really does... The, what it does is it shuts down the beer um, and creates any type of um, beer pockets getting into the, your, your beer line going to your tower. So these are very, uh, you know, upfront costs that definitely in the long run definitely helps you. So we'll, we'll go over those and making sure you know how to prime those and make sure they're getting cleaned. And um, there's different types of those. So we'll go through that. Uh, beer clean glassware, um, obviously the, the biggest uh, step prior to pouring a beer um, there's, there's a lot of variables that can happen in a, in a glass that will reflect onto your pour, your profitability, um, the perfect pour, you know, just knowing how to open. We have, you ha might have a lot of different staff, um, you know, coming in, you know, before now, um, just making sure everyone is very consistent on how you pour a draft beer, because again, this is a, it's a big profitability thing. And, and of course the appearance, the aroma. Um, of, of what goes into that. Uh, we'll go through some uh, basic troubleshooting. So you'll see, you know, an off taste, uh, a wild pour, um, you know, flat beer. So some of those things we'll go through kind of slowly so you guys can see. And of course, some questions and answers at the end. Um, there'll be a chat box you guys can um, punch in and uh, we'll show all of our contacts. So you can have our, our, our email addresses, our, our cell phone numbers, 
And, and, and obviously you have your sales reps and again, your area sales managers and, and sales reps to, to help you with that. So without further ado, uh, Eric, we'll take it away through our, our agenda here. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, just want to go ahead and uh, get started um, getting you guys pouring again. So um, when you do reopen, we always uh, we want to recommend serving the customer, uh, obviously, the freshest product that we can. So um, to get everybody coming back and, and put money in your pocket. So um, as you can kind of see, you will see later in the training uh, any some of the issues that can occur um, if a keg of beer has been served, hasn't been served for a long period of time. Uh, so while you're closing and sitting there, so uh, we just want to make sure first that uh, we want the freshest beer possible inside the uh, the account. Um, if you do have any questions about it, freshness or your current inventory um, or anything at all, um, be related, feel free to reach out to your sales rep. Uh, we've got a very knowledgeable staff here that uh, can definitely help you out. So, um, and then uh, as we touched about earlier, beer lines. Uh, so it's, it's really important uh, to have clean lines. Um, if they haven't been cleaned since closing, uh, we definitely recommend cleaning or uh, getting your line cleaner uh, in your account to, to get that taken care of. Um, we want to get the deep clean of the lines, uh, not only that, but the equipment as well too, the couplers, the fobs, uh, the faucets, everything. So um, if you did get the lines cleaned uh, during the closing, um, we'll show you how to, uh, to balance the draft system on what happens after. So um, very important to get the lines cleaned because uh, you might run into issues. Um, but during this, uh, the setup initial, the restart of your system as well, uh, we're all about safety too. So um, just making sure that uh, when you are inside of your cooler, if you do have a cooler, um, maybe just turn it off uh, so the fans aren't you know, too loud um, because we want you to be able to detect any kind of leaks uh, that might be in your system. Um, CO2 is very harmful. Uh, it's poisonous. Uh, I, uh, so keeping the door open as well, too, uh, just for proper air ventilation. Uh, we don't want anybody uh, getting hurt or anything like that, obviously. So uh, just be on the lookout. Um, listen, keep your ears open for any kind of leaks. Um, you can't obviously can't see CO2 or smell it. So um, just turning off the system while you're, while you're in there working on it, um, getting everything looked at. Uh, making sure everything's tightened, um, couplers inside the inside the cooler or the kegerator, whatever it may be, faucets, fobs. Uh, make sure those have all been tightened um, and cleaned. So that'll prevent any kind of uh, any kind of troubles uh, when you actually you get the system uh, pouring again. So go to the next. All right, so first we'll just go over the line cleaning and the importance of that. Um, things you should kind of look out for. Uh, when your line cleaner is there working on everything. Um, we recommend, and it's a ILCC policy, uh, Illinois Liquor Commission, uh, if you weren't uh, aware of the ILCC acronym, but uh, Illinois Liquor Commission, um, every two weeks. So during that time uh, of the cleaning, uh, they should be not only cleaning the lines, but the couplers and the faucets as well too. Uh, just making sure they, they can either disassemble them, you just get them scrubbed, get them cleaned. Uh, not only is it going to uh, make a better pour, uh, make a better product, but um, increasing the longevity of, of those uh, pieces of equipment as well, too, just making them, making sure they're maintained and cleaned properly. Um, but yeah, and then profit. So a good pour, uh, a good looking pour, a good tasting pour. Uh, if you have dirty lines or dirty equipment and you're not getting a right pour, um, that's money out of the pocket. Uh, right there you can it's right down the drain so it's very important to keep a close eye on these kind of things because uh, ultimately in the long run it's going to make you more money so um but yeah we're gonna just kind of go over the proper procedures uh things that you know you can you can check that they are doing uh, when they're in cleaning your lines uh, not cutting any kind of corners or anything so there's a couple different types of wine cleaning uh we got the pressurized canister cleaning uh, it's mostly used for short draw systems like uh, keg raters, um, keg boxes. Um, so it's going to use uh, the picture on the right with the pressurized canister. Um, and then we've got something for a bigger system, a long draw system, like with the big cooler, multiple taps, uh, is a recirculating cleaning, um, but like a pump, basically. So uh, those are the two types uh, that you may see uh, on the market. 
Uh, so a little bit of a snapshot of the uh, pressurized canister cleaning method. Um, it's going to basically, you they're going to unhook the coupler from the keg, uh, hook it into the, uh, the canister, uh, pour a little bit through till you can see that line solution coming out, uh, letting it soak in the lines, breaking down um, anything that's, you know, stuck to the walls of the lines, whatever it may be with the cleaning solution on the inside. Uh, just letting that sit for several minutes. Um, and then draining it through uh, quite a bit as well, too, into a bucket, um, and then flushing with water eventually when they're done. So uh, that'll help clean out the lines, any deposits or anything that's built up uh, that can eventually, you know, over time, it can produce off tastes, uh, make the beer flat, foamy, whatever. Um, so you want to, uh, another thing to, very important for line cleaning is the taste. Uh, we'll go to the next. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of the, the recirculating method, so the pump. Um, obviously, that's, uh, they're going to connect it to the lines up front, the faucets, with the water, uh, flush it through with water uh, just to get all the beer out at first, uh, and then flush with the, uh, the line cleaner, the chemical, uh, letting it sit. Same method as last time. You want it to sit in the line uh, for several minutes, break down all the deposits, uh, and then the flushing process. Um, so it's it, it's a lot simpler, I guess you could say, than uh, the uh, the canister, because uh, you know you're letting the machine do most of the work because it's recirculating everything through the lines. So uh, and then flushing it with water. And um, yep. Next. All right. So the uh, line and the parts cleaning, uh, as mentioned previously. Not only the line, but some of the equipment and the parts that go into uh, dispensing draft beer. So your faucets, uh, they should be disassembled and brushed. So the shanks, which are on the tower that the faucets are connected to, that should be brushed as well, too. Uh, everything comes in contact with the beer, so you don't want anything to be dirty. Uh, the beer fobs, if you do have fobs, um, like Mike mentioned, not everybody has them, but... Uh, those will be cleaned as well, too, during the process. Uh, and then the couplers, they should be also disassembled and brushed. So um, you can see at the bottom just the difference between uh, a build-up, uh, dirty beer line uh, and a fresh, clean line. Um, so me personally, I would rather drink beer out of the line on the right than the left. So. Uh, moving on to glycol systems, not everybody's going to have this, uh, like we had mentioned. Um, this is mainly going to be for uh, long draw systems when you have a cooler. Uh, there's a few different types that you uh, you might have if you do have one, um, and they're pictured here. we got the Micromatic uh, brand, the Banner is in the middle, and then the Perlic on the right. Um, some of the systems will, they might have two cords coming off of them, so if they were unplugged, um, make sure you, you plug everything in that, uh, any, any cords, one's for the compressor and then the other one's for the pump. So, uh, just making sure that, uh, everything's plugged in so the system can power on and operate correctly. Um, and then actually the, uh, the temperature settings as well too. Uh, if that had been adjusted prior to closing, uh, you want to make sure that you get that adjusted down to the correct temperature, which would be 28 to 30 degrees. Um, and then while you're at the, at the glycol system as well, too, you want to check the, uh, the mixture, the glycol bath, just make sure it's clean, um, not dirty. It's, it's full. Um, and then the coils as well, too, on that glycol pack, uh, the coils, you want them to be cleaned, uh, blown out, uh, any kind of dust or anything in there can get in the glycol bath and get dirty. It can overheat the system. Um, so that wouldn't be cut. So making sure it's all clean and stuff, but uh, if you have any issues with that or any questions, um, definitely reach out to either your draft system installer. Uh, you can also reach out to uh, even the, the manufacturer of your glycol pack as well, too. Um, they can definitely help you out. All right, so once that's taken care of, uh, you can go ahead and move on to uh, turning on your gas and getting everything balanced. Um, most likely, uh, a lot of stuff on here, it, it might not have been messed with prior to closing, but uh, just in case, you know, we'll, we'll touch on that stuff. Um, so turning on the gas, uh, first off, your, your actual gas tank, uh, the CO2 tank, you want to make sure that the valve is all the way open on that. Um, but then once that's open, you can move to the regulators. Um, 
So on the right, we've got a picture of a primary regulator, uh, the valve. Um, if it's horizontal or pointing left and right, uh, it's going to be in the off position. So you want to go ahead and uh, turn that on, make sure it's horizontal up and down. Um, so once that's on, uh, you're going to be able to see, you should see the gauges move. So yeah, that'll be a, um, an indication that the gas is on, uh, ready to go. Um, a common uh, pressure for any short draw or kegerator systems is going to be around 12 to 14 PSI. Um, that's going to be the gauge on top. You'll see a video of this as well, too, after the slide, um, explaining a little more about the pressure. Um, some regulators, as look, uh, if you see on the bottom left, uh, some, some of them have like a knob rather than a screw to adjust any pressure that you might need. Um, so depending on what model you have, um, either the one on the, on the bottom left or the bottom right, um, you can pull out that knob and then turn it to the right or the left to adjust pressure. Left will decrease, right will increase uh, to get to that desired 12 to 14 PSIs. Um, and then the right hand picture, you got the, uh, the screw. Um, so just a screwdriver or uh, whatever can fit in there. People use dimes, for, <laughs> um, you know, turn it to the right to increase, left to decrease, same, same procedure. Um, but ultimately once you get everything, uh, all the pressure set, um, when you do start to pour the beer, uh, you should get about two ounces per second. So a pint glass is normally going to take eight seconds from start to finish on a, on a good balance system. First, turn the CO2 canister until it is completely open. Next, turn on the flow of gas. Horizontal is off and vertical is on. The top gauge shows the applied pressure. The left gauge, called high pressure, shows how much gas is in the tank. Red means you're low and you'll need a backup. Next we apply the same actions with our nitrogen tank. Open the tank fully, turn on the flow of gas, top is applied pressure, left gauge is high pressure, and 45 pounds of pressure is the amount you want if you have a long draw system. Great. Uh, so next we'll talk about blender boxes. Uh, again, not everybody's going to have this component as well. Um, these are mainly going to be for long draw systems that use both CO2 and a nitrogen tank. Um, to uh, it's blended, so um, using both of those gases, uh, it's it's pretty beneficial if you're uh, pouring um, stouts as well as ales and lagers. So all three different kinds of uh, different styles of beers. Um, so this will help apply the correct amount of pressure to those beers inside the cooler. Um, but if you are using a blender box, just uh, make sure again these have valves as well too. So uh, make sure the valves are open, so in the downward position. Um, the primary regulator that's on the tank that you saw in the video on the last slide, um, make sure that that is around 65 to 70 PSI um, for your primaries. And then the gauges on the actual blender box uh, should be set at 40 PSI. And there will be a, another video here showing that as well. Um, but also secondary regulators that are inside of your coolers, uh, they can be specifically balanced for the uh, the type of beer that the line is hooked into. So um, they can be adjusted just like primary regulators with, um, you know, pulling them out, turning them. Uh, so you can set the actual pressure on the inside. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about balancing those, um, anything in depth, um, just recommend, you know, your system installer. Uh, they can uh, definitely answer any questions on balancing your system. We have our CO2 line coming into the blender box, the nitrogen line coming into the blender box, our stout line going into the cooler, and our ales and lager line going into the cooler. Turn on each valve, pull out and adjust the knob to set 40 pounds of pressure on each. The nitro stout line will be preset to a mix of 25% CO2 and 75% nitrogen. The ale and lager will be preset to 60% CO2 and 40% nitrogen. All right, so just a quick uh, rundown of the different keg types that uh, we carry at Lakeshore Beverage. So 
On the left hand side, you'll see um, we offer anything from uh, half barrels to six barrels. Um, a lot of the times, those quarter barrels, you'll see the the slim variety. Uh, we do have a couple brands, maybe they use the the short stubby ones on the quarter barrels. Um, and then on the right, uh, some of our imported kegs, uh, for example, Stella. Um, our biggest keg is going to be a 50 liter, uh, which is uh, almost similar to the half barrel on um, domestic, and then the 20 liters, which is very similar to the six barrels as well, too. Uh, so just uh, an example of some of the kegs you might receive from us. So we'll move to uh, actually inside the cooler. Um, so generally, uh, most systems left to right inside of the cooler is going to be left to right on the tower when you're standing behind the bar. Uh, so it's beneficial to know whenever you're tapping lines and uh, putting on tap handles, uh, knowing which line to tap that keg on um, to match it up with the line behind the bar. So um, inside of the cooler as well, uh, temperature is a very thing, very important thing to uh, to pay attention to. So um, a lot of times if you do have a cooler, it's going to have a gauge on the outside. Um, those don't always work. So um, the best way that we, we recommend is using uh, like a cup of water, a glass of water inside of the cooler uh, with a thermometer inside. Um, that's going to give you a very accurate reading on the temperature. Or if you wanted to, if you can, uh, you can open like a bottle of beer, um, put a thermometer in there and, and take a temperature reading that way as well too. Um, but when you are inside the cooler, uh, if you don't have any kegs tapped, just make sure um, that your couplers are, aren't in the engaged position. So, uh, make sure they will look like the picture on the right hand side. Um, if they are tapped, uh, without actually being on a keg, uh, you're going to get some, some gas leaking out. So, um, definitely be, uh, be cognizant of that. Uh, but yeah, so once everything's turned on, um, go ahead and tap your kegs and, uh, Go ahead and, uh, yeah, just tap them, and then we can probably go behind the bar. Most draft systems are set up left to right in the cooler and will pour from left to right when positioned behind the bar. Here we have our coupler, gas line, beer line, and keg. First, we'll attach the gas source to the side inlet. This will bring gas into the keg to push the beer out. Check that there is a Thomas valve before tightening the nut until it is snug. Next, check for a washer in the beer line nut, then connect to the top and tighten until snug. Before connecting the coupler, make sure the handle is in the up position, or you will take a beer shower. Align the two tabs on the keg with the open ends on the coupler. Check that the coupler is flush with the keg, then turn to the right until tight. Engage the handle down until you hear a click. All right, so we'll go over a few different types of couplers uh, that may be needed for uh, different types of kegs. Um, on the left, we've got our domestic couplers. It's going to be the most common uh, that you'll see. Um, they're going to be used for almost all domestic beers uh, like Bud, Bud Light, Ultra. Uh, next to that is going to be the S-style coupler or the Euro coupler. Um, this is mainly going to be used for Stella. Uh, you might see that they look very similar, but um, in the, uh, the European couplers have a, a longer probe. Uh, so you can see kind of at the bottom of that, um, the Euro coupler picture, um, you can actually see the probe sticking out, even though the coupler is not engaged. So, um, having the right style coupler, if you tried to tap a stellar keg with a domestic coupler, we see that issue sometimes that's uh, not going to work. The probe's not long enough. It's not going to enter the keg and, uh, no, there's no beer that's going to uh, be dispensed, um, opposite way around. Uh, like Chris mentioned in that video, you're going to take a beer shower if you try to put a Euro keg in or a Euro coupler in a domestic keg. Um, next, we've got an A coupler, is also a slide coupler uh, that's used for most uh, German style beers, uh, for example, Franzis Connor. Uh, and then we've got a U style coupler on the far right, uh, which is mainly used for um, Guinness, Harp, and Smith experience. So just to go over uh, the pieces of the coupler, um, there's a few important things uh, regarding the maintenance and troubleshooting for kegs and the couplers. Um, like I mentioned before, over time, certain parts might kind of deteriorate if they're not maintained uh, properly, but they, they can cause problems uh, when dispensing the beer. Um, the main thing we, we kind of see out in the, in the field when we do draft calls 
uh, is just any kind of defects, especially to the body washers, which is uh, on the very bottom. Um, maybe the O-rings on the inside get worn out over time or the probe seals. Um, sometimes that'll, you know, if there is a small crack in there, um, it can cause the beer to be foamy and, uh, and other issues too. So uh, occasionally visibly checking those parts um, can save you a little bit of trouble in the long run, thinking that maybe something's wrong with your system. If it's uh, something as simple as, simple as maybe replacing some kind of part on the coupler. Um, and then, yeah, regular cleaning of that, obviously it's going to uh, help maintain the performance and longevity of that part. Um, and then the handle, the hinge pin, um, sometimes that gets loose over time. So just making sure that that's tightened. It's very easy to tighten. Just uh, can do it with a screwdriver. Uh, Fobs. So uh, not everybody's going to have these, as we mentioned, but um, once you do get the kegs tapped, you're going to need to fill those. So there are different styles of fobs. Um, every one of them does pretty much the same thing, though. The same they serve the same purpose. Um, something to definitely pay attention to whenever the uh, the fob is full. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, that picture there's a little bobber on the inside. Uh, you want to make sure that that is floating. Uh, if it's not floating, if it's down, uh, then no beer is going to come out on the on the other end on the tower. So. Um, just uh, a good way to troubleshoot those. Just untap the keg, um, release the, uh, you can push down on the top of the fob um, to fill it, retap the keg, um, and it'll eventually, it'll eventually rise too. So uh, making sure that it, uh, that it is floating is, uh, is a good thing because it won't pour without it. So. And like I mentioned, there's different types of fobs. And on the next slide here, you can see it few different types. So to fill a fob, um, you'll just basically want to uh, make sure that it's in the um, in the operating mode rather than the service mode. Um, and then on the top, there's always going to be either a lever or a button um, that you can push down or push forward uh, that's going to fill that fob up with beer from the keg. Um, to you know, Like Mike said, to get any kind of bubbles out, um, get that foam out so whenever you do go pour, uh, you're going to get a, a you're going to get beer instead of foam. Uh, so we'll move on next to the importance of clean glassware. Um, so a lot of times uh, you might have a, either a three sink system or a dishwasher, uh, but having a beer ready glass is is very important. Um, not only for the taste, but for the presentation of the beer. Um, so pretty self explanatory. I mean, uh, using a, a a glass brush on the first sink with a uh, beer approved um, glass cleaning soap, uh, making sure you not only get the inside scrubbed nice and good, but uh, the outside as well as the bottom. Um, and then once you do the rinse, uh, you want to use the heel and heel out method. Uh, so you want to get a good rinse on it uh, with um, fresh rinse water uh, and then sanitizing as well too. Um, same method, heel in, heel out. Um, with a brewery approved sanitizer in the last step. And then uh, making sure that you place it on a drying rack, um, don't place uh, clean glasses on a towel or anything that won't allow them to get a proper airflow to get clean and dry on the inside. To achieve a beer clean glass inside of a three compartment sink, first empty the glass into an open drain if dirty, wash with non-petroleum based sudless soap and brush, rinse in cold water, heel in, heel out, rinse in sanitizer, heel in, heel out, and dry inverted on a rack so air circulates inside. Awesome. Yeah, so there are a few different tests that you can do. Um, recommend these, uh, you know, if you have new staff or whatnot that you're teaching them to, to get beer ready glassware, you can do a test afterward, make sure everything um, is looking okay. Um, also, if you do use a dishwasher, just to make sure it's operating correctly. Um, but the different types of tests at the bottom, the sheeting test, uh, if you dip it in water, that should uh, water should shed evenly off the glass. Um, if it has a, a film on it, and then it'll break up into droplets um, and just kind of stay there on the surface. Uh, also, the salt test, you can sprinkle salt on the inside. Um, it should adhere to the glass and stick. If there's any 
pockets where it doesn't, then it's uh, it's going to be dirty. Uh, and then the lacing test. So after your uh, your customer's done drinking it, you should be able to see a lacing around the glass. So actually being at the bar. So um, once your gas is turned on and the uh, the kegs are tapped, we're going to go to the uh, to the bar and start pouring. So. Um, we always want to grab the handle from the bottom, pull it back in a quick motion. Um, a lot of bartenders, they will grab the tap handles from the top. It's definitely not the correct way to do it. Um, not only can you break the handle or break the parts on the faucet, but um, you're not allowing the faucet to open up as quickly as you can, uh, which is going to most likely result in a, a foam in your beer. Uh, we do have a demonstration link for the perfect pour that um, you can click on afterward. Uh, when we do post this um, on our website, uh, that we can, it's a good demonstration. It's from Bar Rescue, uh, if you've seen the TV show. So, um, And then making sure your glassware is clean, obviously. So uh, on the pictures on the right, we've got an example of how the, you can easily tell if a glass is dirty when it does get poured. Uh, bubbles are going to stick to the side of it, uh, and then the head of foam is going to dissipate very quickly. Um, so that's a good indication that maybe the staff isn't washing them correctly or the dishwasher's not working or whatever it may be. So, uh, clean glass where should leave the lacing as we had mentioned. Um, and then there's another video on how to properly tighten and remove a faucet uh, if you needed to wash that as well too. Start with a glass that has been freshly rinsed. Grab from the bottom of the handle as grabbing from the top will create more foam. Hold the glass at a 45 degree angle and begin to straighten. Be sure to keep an air gap between the faucet and the beer to prevent bacteria growth. A properly maintained draft system should pour at a rate of two ounces per second. And you should end up with a one to two finger collar of foam. All right, so just some things that we might see um, that could be going wrong with the, with the pour. Um, so temperature is a, is a main factor for a lot of uh, pouring issues, temperature and pressure. Um, so just making sure your kegs are between 36, 38 degrees inside of your cooler or your kegerator uh, and that the beer is not pouring any more than 40 degrees. Uh, so some common issues, uh, foamy beer, um, you know, temperature related, your cooler might be too warm. Um, the beer line system might have hot spots uh, if your glycol isn't working properly. Uh, frozen glassware can cause foamy beer as well, too. Um, dirty and broken faucets, so uh, the importance of the line cleaner, just getting everything cleaned. Uh, and then too much pressure if the system isn't balanced correctly. Um, flat beer as well, too. Um, dirty glassware, uh, not enough CO2 on the barrel. So balancing the system is important for not only foamy, but flat beer issues as well, too. Getting that two ounces per second pour is very important. Um, cloudy beer, hazy beer, um, it could have been frozen at some point or over chilled. Uh, the beer hose is in uh, old or poor condition. Uh, beer line's not clean and then off tasting beer. Um, again, beer line's not being clean, kegs not being rotated. Um, and then some, maybe an air compressor is used instead of CO2 for, uh, for pressure. So um, those are some common issues uh, in troubleshooting for that. So um, just kind of con to conclude, so um, getting your draft system reopened. So making sure, again, your lines are cleaned, equipment's cleaned, uh, everything's ready to go, everything's tightened up. Um, if you are using glycol, make sure that temperature is set uh, and the system is balanced with the gas um, and then tapping and test pouring. So uh, remember two ounces per second, that's the, the main thing. Uh, and then the last step, obviously, enjoying um, the beer with your customers. So. Getting, getting business rolling again.